So I'll go ahead, this is my presentation, who I am. Um, the agenda is what is XML? Then we have JSON, but why bother about XML? And the information standards based mainly on XML. And how can Delphi help you to process XML documents with XML libraries or XML frameworks and tools? And then I'll show you the enhancements being made in XML Mapper and also how to process some documents in XML Mapper. Give you some examples with e invoicing in Mexico, CFDI, and also e invoicing in Brazil, NFE. So, what is XML? This may look like an academic thing, but many people still don't quite understand the difference. So, bear with me, I'll, I'll show you just quickly. XML is a software and hardware independent tool for storing and transporting data. It means extensible markup language. It's the same foundation used in HTML for web developing. But XML was designed to store and transport data, whereas HTML is to show content and graphic um, information. XML was designed to be self-descriptive and is nowadays a full standard by the W3C recommendation. You have a small sample there of XML on that snippet on the right-hand side. The difference is that XML have different goals, XML and HTML. XML was designed to carry data. We focus on what data is. Much about the same way a database structure and a database schema is, like an SQL server. That's the same thing about the XML. HTML, on the other hand, was designed to display data with focus on how the data looks on the screen. Another key difference is that the XML tags are not predefined like HTML are. So on XML, you're basically free to make any tags you want and to follow any, any structure that you may want. Unlike HTML, which is a very uh, defined, well-defined standard. So the, the, the tags that are defined within HTML are must follow the standards so your browser can recognize the HTML page. In, in the bottom hand, you can see the same information or similar information in XML with changing the tag names. So even though generically is the same information, you're free to add or remove things on your own structure. And it's still XML and still good to go. This is an XML document tree, a sample one. For those of you that are not familiar with how an XML document is being composed of, you always have a root element at the very top. In this case, in the sample that I'm giving you is called the bookstore. That's the, the root and the topmost parent of all the other elements in an XML document. Then uh, under the root, you always have a, at least an element. And elements, think of them like, um, like a big node of data, which can have under, the, under themselves, underneath themselves that they can have other elements or they can have attributes. Attributes are like a children of an element. They belong to a specific element. The other elements are simply um, underneath on the structure, but elements themselves, those other elements can also have attributes. And finally, within an element, you, have an, you can have a text element belonging to that, meaning a text area. This tree that you see graphically here, we have a root element on the top, and then we have one single element below, and then four more elements. On those four elements, finally, each one of them has a text content. The first element has an attribute, which is a category. One of the other elements of the sibling elements has another attribute, which is lang, stands for language. And this is how it looks like once you follow the tagging mandated by XML. You always have a header, what version of XML you are defining, and the encoding of the XML. That's like a mandatory. Once you have that, then you have the definition of the actual tags. Won't go further. The point being is that that graphic tree that shows information is exactly represented by this XML document there. One thing to notice is that elements always go within the tag brackets and the attributes are always inside the brackets. So for example, in the third line there, you can see that we have a one element with a book tag, the book tag, and within that one, you have category equals cooking. So attributes are always inside the bracket, but elements are always composed in the full bracket. Now go just two lines below, you have author, Giada de Laurentiis. 
that's the text content that is inside the, the element. We won't go much to that. It's just a quick reminder for those that are not totally familiar with XML. But this is a key thing to remember. You have elements, you have attributes, and you have text contents. Most of you will ask, well, we have JSON. Why bother about XML? To some of you, it may even look like a, a relic of the past. Well, XML and JSON both are used in many aspects of web development. Both are used to separate data from the presentation. Both are, do not carry information about how to be displayed. We have HTML for that. With XML and JSON, the separation between data and the presentation. But here, here's the fact. JSON rules nowadays in standard REST web development. Almost any project done within the last 10 years that focuses on simple and quick data transmission uses JSON. And when you talk about REST web development, you are almost, almost always talking about JSON as the preferred um, protocol to transmit the data within your, your REST development. Now, this is not written in stone. You can actually have a REST web development using XML as the actual protocol that carries your, your data. But the de facto standard in REST web development, most people will always go with JSON. Why? Because it's much simpler to implement. It's less verbose to say it one way. So you know the, the tagging that you is enforced in XML makes it a bit hard sometimes to write and comply with the rules of closing the tags completely. JSON is a much more user-friendly on those terms. But then, precisely that strictness of XML is what makes SML the king in enterprise level data validation, strong web and data interchange development. Because JSON is too simple, when you do need additional characteristics that are provided by XML, like data, data validation and more strict and more robust uh, type definition, XML here is where it shines. And the de facto, it's the de facto standard for most corporate and enterprise level data transmissions. These are just a sampler of the top of the iceberg of those information standards based mainly in XML. Now, again, this is web standards. So these are also not written in stone. You could implement only of these standards on JSON. But in practice, you almost never see JSON in these standards. So electronic data interchange, which is uh, uh, industry standards used for interchanging data between business to business and sometimes even to business to customers. These are the top three guys. Is ANSI ASC X12 is a predominant electronic data interchange um, standard in America, North America. Canada and the US. And then we have the United Nations founded and promoted EDIFACT. Uh, this is the global standard and is predominant outside of North America. So any other country in the world uses UN EDIFACT. And then we have another very predominant one, GS1. GS1 EDI is used in almost all the global supply chain industry. That is the standard they have focused on. And that's just to give you a sample. Those three alone give you a, a lot of the biggest share of the data transmission being handled by biggest big corporations. Usually this is done between ERP packages and sometimes it's done with third party components that do all the, the assembly of the data and composing the EDI mandatory structures, which are pretty complex. But they are standards, and that's the beauty of this. Since they are standard, any high-level package or any corporation that hires a software developer or hires a company with the right software can immediately connect and start transmitting data because everything is so standard here. So that's the key word when you're talking in the enterprise and um, corporate development is you need to give results quickly so the the best solution is always stick to the standards, to the standards that are, that are, proven, are proven and tried and work already immediately. Another area, big area for XML that has grown within the last 10 years is electronic invoicing. It started in some selected countries around 2010, maybe even before that, but the actual implementation in real use enforced by governments around 2010 
started in Brazil, started in Mexico, started in some other European countries. And then since then, slowly but steadily, the adoption has grown by other countries, very significantly, to the point that the European e-invoicing implementation approved by the European Union was enforced since 2014 to be fully applied on 2020. And yes, it happened on 2020, at least government to business transactions are fully with electronic invoicing now. The only thing that is, is still ongoing is to gradually increment the enforcement of the rule until all contributors, contributors like a small business, which are usually the last ones to be implemented, um, are totally in the, in the enforcement of the rule. Countries like Mexico and Brazil nowadays are 100% um, electronic invoicing. Any business operator, even the smallest ones, they must do everything through electronic invoicing. So eventually we see that in the future, within maybe 10, 10 years, almost, almost all predominant countries with significant business transactions will be fully with e-invoicing implementing. So this is a big thing happening as we speak. This is a, just a quick chart. The blue countries on this map already implemented uh, e electronic invoicing. The ones in, in little red or purple there, they, they are recently adopted this last year in 2022, but they finally are officially embracing it. And now there's some enforcement to at least uh, government to business transactions must be done with e invoicing. And the only ones left are those in gray, but you can see that there are not that many. So as I said, in around five to 10 years, we see that most of the countries in the world will be fully on their e-invoicing schemes. Now, how can Delphi help you to process XML documents? We have XML libraries. Some of them have been there since the beginning of times, Delphi times, like the TXML document, which internally uses either Microsoft's XML library, that's by default, but you can toggle it with some um, variables and some switches to use Omni XML, which is a little less powerful than the XML one. But those, the problem with that implementation is the XML, the TXML document implementation, the component in Delphi is, you, is relies heavily on interfaces since the MS XML uh, library is com based If you think I'm speaking in Chinese to you, some of those that don't know, com based is the Microsoft standard to, to create an object can be, can be reused in any other language, mainly C++ at that time with the Visual Basic and now with .NET. But the problem is it's very cumbersome to implement and Delphi has full support for the com based uh, objects. Actually, it was many of the Delphi technologies were using COM at the beginning. But it's difficult to use them. It's um, hard to develop when you're in Delphi because the changing, um, the bridging of the interfaces is hard to follow. So the, the trend is uh, for Delphi development is to have components as much as possible written in pure Delphi or even combined with C++. But if you can, the interface is defined completely inside the Delphi code. Because if you rely on external DLLs, like the Microsoft One does, it's, it's hard to debug, hard to trace. And just you can develop with them, you get very powerful uh, capabilities, but it's a bit tricky and catchy to use. And because of that one reason, many people prefer, if they can, to bypass and not use the TXML document, even though that's the standard document, the standard component provided by Delphi. We have, um, XML, which is a fork of Omni XML, and this is purely done in, in, in Delphi, Object Pascal. There's another pure Object Pascal library called Open XML. There's a very recent project by, by one Embarcadero MVP, it's called Nestlib.xml. Um, they even claim that use the, the least amount of memory and processing resources, and they are very fast. So uh, if you want to try and you are in the need of a pure Delphi um, XML library, that one seems to be a very neat and nice library to use. Um, 
In the other hand, you also have frameworks and tools. Delphi itself has provided for at least uh, since Delphi 4 and 3, which is almost 20 years now, has provided two tools. One of them is XML data binding, which allows you to, if you have a well-formatted XML document and you want to, instead of you manually creating all the interfaces to all the possible nodes and attributes, like the tree that I just showed to you before, there is this automated tool that will read an XML document and detect which ones are elements, which ones are attributes, and which ones are the text content, and we'll create a template code for you to handle that document. This helps you a lot if you are reusing the same structure of the document over and over, because then you already, this tool already created the code for you. It won't work if you are handing varying structures of XML documents or totally different XML documents, then it won't help you. So this is only when you're reusing the exact same type of structure over and over. Then the XML data binding, we create a, a Delphi unit with all the code ready for you to read exactly that structure that is already in the template of the unit. You just call the unit and the, the names of the elements and everything inside the, the content is already done for you. Now, this is the tool provided for raw XML documents. Like I should say that way. But when the document that you are handling, you know that contains data that can be moved over to a database, then you have a much more powerful tool, which is the good old XML mapper. The idea of XML mapper is when you have an XML document where internally somehow those elements that I showed to you and the attributes that are there somehow mimic or behave like a database, meaning they're repeating with the same structure over and over like a record. And each one of those repeating sections have the same uh, sections of data like fields with the same type or similar types. Then, and that is happening. There's any information that is really a translation of a data table or some kind of a fixed structure data that was converted into XML. And then those can be processed through XML Mapper. And what XML Mapper will do for you is similar to the data binding, it will create some template coding, but it will go a bit ahead of that because yes, at the beginning it needs to create some interfacing of how to read the XML document with the XML library. But then in addition to that, it will create some mapping of those elements that were detected internally as potential data rows, data, data rows with data fields, and create mappings to your own database. So at the end, what you can do with this tool, with, with the code provided by XML Mapper, is that you can feed this XML document that looks like a database. You run the code created by XML Mapper at runtime, and then it will automatically feed and fill your database with those data from the XML document in almost no code type by you. You just call the, the, all this code that was created automatically by XML Mapper. Now, many of you will say, oh, great, that sounds fantastic. How I never heard about this one. And that's the reason we are making this, this webinar today, this presentation is because I see that many people, even though the XML Mapper is available in Delphi, Many of them don't even know what it is for or what's the use they can make of it. So I'm trying to make some good cases here to show you why this is a great tool, but also we recognize that there have been some glitches on the original version of XML Mapper, which um, impeded some of the people of really, really using it to the full because it has some original bugs by design that were never taken, out, taken care of and some improvements that needed to be done to handle nowadays modern XML schemas. So let me go ahead and show you that. First of all, the enhancements done in XML Mapper. Let me just run this one here too. I'm right now showing you XML Mapper. One of the enhancements is it, it received a facelift. The original version of XML Mapper, well, I'll just show you to you the difference. 
This is the original version of XML Mapper that has been shipping with the product since for 20 years now. So it's kind of old look and feel, the very old look and feel, like Windows 95 style. And this is a new style with VCL styles provided by Delphi for maybe three, four versions now. So this is a new look. In addition to the look, those that have a, a sharp eye will notice that now we have additional parameters that never existed before. Namely, we have these fields here and also this field over here. And what happens now is we have these three parameters that allow you, number one, the maximum number of nested levels that you can have when processing an XML document. We found that in some XML documents, when they you, you processing schemas, I beg your pardon, didn't make the explanation, but a schema is a part of the XML standard. And think about an XML schema, like in a database, the schema that shows you the structure of your database. So it's not the data, but it's how this, the database is made, how, what, what's the type of each one of the fields in your tables, what's the name of each one of the fields. So that definition of your database in XML is done through a, a file called XML schema. And the extension of those files are XSD. The beauty of the schemas is that they not only define the structure of potential structure of an XML file, but at the same time, the schema adds some validation rules. So it, it can tell the type of the field, the data that a specific component can have in XML. It can add some constraints like uh, greater than five, less than seven, whatnot. So this is a very, one of the reasons why XML is much more powerful than JSON because with the XML schemas, you can have a very strong set of rules uh, that will enforce, if you have the right tool that reads the schema correctly, then the tool will validate that anything stored in your XML file follows and complies with those constraints and validation rules. So here in XML Mapper has the capability since the beginning to read XML schemas. And this is the recommended way to go because the schema defines everything that can potentially come in your XML file. If you read the direct XML file, it will work, but the XML file is, a, is already with only the data. The XML files themselves don't have the validation rules. So here the, the recommendation always is if you can, if you have access to the XML schema of your XML document, please use XML schema as the input to XML mapper because then XML mapper will be able to interpret those constraints and validations that need to be enforced on your XML file. And also we'll read whether some of the elements or some of the attributes on your, on your XML file, whether they are optional or required, mandatory. And also the schema will tell whether there's some repeatness on those elements. They say, oh, this element can be repeated over and over endlessly, or this element can be selected only once, or this element can be optional, then means can be zero or one, or it can be repeated for a limited number of times, like uh, uh, this element can be repeated from five to 10 times only. So all those options of, of repeating and optional, an XML schema will provide you with. I'm gonna load first a very simple schema to show you what I'm talking about. So this is a very, very, very simple one, Hoover schema. Once it's been processed, you have two elements, full and full bar. So full bar is an element under full. This is in the visual interpretation of the schema. The schema is here. So again, you will see that it's, it may look a little complicated, but the schemas have elements like this one, which precisely tell a, hey, this can occur a minimum times of one or a maximum numbers of time of one time the name of the element, blah, blah, blah. So this is a, a quick example. This is a too small, I'm gonna load another. Let me just clear everything here. So when you are loading up some pretty complex schemas, I'll go to a sample schema up here. Hold on, hold on. I'm in the wrong area. Let me go back to schema, load schemas, and then I'll show you 
author simple. This is a simple schema where I have author at the top level. This is the root element. And we have within author, we have a text content name. Now at the same level, level of name, we have two more elements. One element is called posts and the other element is called books. And then you can see that under posts, we have yet another element called items. And finally, under that one, we have two more elements, which are the final leaves, one called title, another one called content. Under books, you have another uh, element called items, and other items you have title and ISBN. Great, so we have our XML schema that has been parsed. This is the raw schema. You see that it's very verbose. So yes, XML is already, always very verbose. And if you are handling schemas, they are really, really very verbose. But it's being handled, translated for you. XML mapper read the schema, and then it's showing you this sample document that compute that schema. And then this has these nice icons to make it clearer what type of uh, elements you are looking at. Um, you can see that we have uh, like a replicating structure. We have items on the two sides, but one item has title and content under post, and the other items has title and ISBN under groups. The original XML mapper would have some hard time trying to distinguish them. If you had some parent element like items here, so when you do the mapping, it will take only the first one. It wouldn't, it wouldn't recognize the second one because it was a, a, a similar name one and it wouldn't have that logic. You see that I now made it to select all of those. So here it's correctly identifying post is two and then books here. I'll go all the way to create a sample XML wrapper. So on the right hand side, this is a, a, a created automatically created database schema by XML mapper. And what you see here is we have name, POIT title, POIT content, POIT, BOIT title, and BOIT ISBN. This is the final data proposed data field names by XML mapper to map from that XML file on the left-hand side. We know that databases have to be flat and XML files can be multi-level. So you already see here uh, a quick example of how you do a mapping. So this file created here, just by clicking the automated tools by XML Mapper, created these automated names, database names. And one feature here is that, as I said in the past, if you had repeating items with the same name, it would not recognize it. And also, it would not make the right naming because it wouldn't have the right logic to detect the, the repeating elements. Now we have this new parameter. This new parameter, what it does is takes uh, the prefix of the data field name by using the parents, as many parents as you have behind the, that element. So in case of this one title, the first parent is items, and the next parent, the grandparent is post. So it takes two letters of each one, PO from post, IT from items, then this, that becomes the prefix of the, of the field name. So PO, IT underscore title. By the same token, this one that I'm highlighting here, ISBN. ISBN is taking the first parent I, items and then the grandparent, books. Then books is BO, items is IT. Then the prefix is the combination BOIT underscore ISBN. By improving, the, by introducing this new logic, then there's no clash possibility on the potential fields. Now, some of you may say, hey, but two letters may not be enough to make the unit. You are right. So I'll show again another one. Let me clear here. And I will load a, another sub schema. And this one, I intentionally, on the second leaf, we have posts as the original one. But on this second one, we have portals. So intentionally, I'm making the two leaves the two letters that they start with are the same, PO. So when I do the full thing of selecting them all and create a automatic database, you can see now that XML mapper didn't crash. 
Instead, it detected that these two names were similarly named, and then it automatically added a suffix with a sequential number. So in, the, in those cases that you have the potential of having duplicated names, it will add this suffix. Now, some of this logic was already in the original XML map, adding the suffix number. But the problem was detecting duplicated trees or parent um, elements. That definitely wouldn't work. But if you do want unique names and you don't want these sequential numbers, then that's where this parameter comes handy. What you can do is uh, I'll remove this one here. And they'll say, instead of two, use three. Then it will use three letters of each one of the parent and grandparent and as much as all the levels above the, the final data. So when you create a romantic database, you see that now it's using three letters and three letters were enough to make them unique. So it doesn't need to add the suffix sequential number anymore. There's other things that have been added that weren't here before. Let me just clear this one up. We have um, this schema has repeating elements. What's repeating elements? Again, is those keywords that I showed to you in the first one. So this element here, which is the posts, now I have redefined it to be from one to 10 can be repeating from one to 10 times. That's on the schema. So the schema is saying, look, the final XML document that complies with this schema can have this node repeating from one to 10 times and is valid. What that means is it must be there at least one time, but no more than 10 times. If the XML document that you read and parse has 15, instances of this element, then it's not valid. It's not good. If it, it doesn't have any, it has zero, it's also not good. But any repeating number between one and 10 is valid. This is what the schema is saying here. So now it says it can be from one to 10, but how many do you actually want to be mapped? And that's the parameter that you can see over here, maximum repeating nodes. So within the compliance of the schema, we are telling them, please put me four repeating notes of those that can vary. So the document that you see here, we have posts. I will close this one to make it easier for you. You see that now under posts, you have one, two, three, four repeating elements. So the schema is telling you it can be repeated from one to 10. And this parameter is saying, okay, then put up to four. Of course, this is a maximum limit. If the schema said from one to two, then it will be only two instead of four. Four is like that. If you can, this is the number that I want. But finally, the number that it will use is a number that complies with the schema. In this case, four complies with the schema, then it will follow your preferred number, which is four. Then we have one, two, three, four. And the other, Element books, I said this, put the same setting. So now books can also be one, two, three, four, repeating times. And now you will say, well, how this thing is gonna be mapped? Simple, let's do it and see what's well, the new logic. I'm selecting them. Number one, you can see that now those all repeating ones, the first instance keeps the original name, not change. But from the second and the third onwards, XML mapper is now adding something that is compliant with the XML syntax. It's adding an index, an index. And indexes in XML is with a bracket, square brackets and the number inside. So this is the way you do indexing in XML. You see that then the very first instance has nothing, but then the second one now has the, the bracket index one, and then the third one bracket index two, and then the fourth one bracket index three. Now we create the, data, the automatic database. When you go to the flat database, instead of the brackets, what you see is a underscore one, which is compliant with a normal database field name. And this is the way that they get mapped one to one. So all this that I'm showing you here is enhancements we have done. So to be able to make data the XML mapper work with modern XML schemas. There's a lot of pretty complex and heavy uh, XML schemas out there.
that the XML mapper was not able to parse and process. And our aim and our goal is that anything out there that is used at a industry standard level, like those EDIs and the e invoicing ones, our final goal is make XMAPR be able to read any of those so that the tool can be freely used by any of you in a corporate environment when you see fit. So that's the final goal. So far, so good, um, but we're still on this. Showing you the preview of what we've been working on, but that's the final goal. XMAPR must be able to process any XML schema. Um, now we'll show you another one. There's also many schemas have a way to have uh, recursive definitions. Uh, when you have recursive definitions, you have um, something that looks queer, like the original one that I was showing here, this one. So this is a, a, a schema that defines itself. You see the final leaf is the pointing to the parent. So this is the way you do recursive definitions in XML schema. And now you can see that you have five repeating ones, Wi-Fi only because we also added this new, this new parameter. So recursive count comes in place, comes handy when you have recursive nodes in your schema, something that your original XML mapper was not able to handle. Actually, it would crash because the recursiveness would create a stack overflow. So now XML mapper is able to detect these recursive definitions and you can limit them. You just set them a, a hard limit. And that's the way to go. Actually, any uh, XML utility out there that has this capability, they will tell you, OK, what's the maximum way I can define this recursive? No one will allow you to be endlessly recursive. But, but the schema is made that way like a, you choose, meaning the end user will decide how deep you want to go with the recursiveness. So another way to see, this is a simple schema that I was showing, but there's a real one here that we have from Garmin. So for those of you that said, ah, oh, those things are strange, those will never happen. Well, this is a, um, a data exchange schema by Garmin, and it has this recursive thing. So after it finishes processing this schema, along with me, you see that, yeah, all this is with that setting. So I. I put a maximum of the recursiveness. So if you count here folders, you will see that you have five levels of recursiveness of folders. All right, so that's what, I, by showing the enhancements we have done in XML Mapper. So the enhancements have been mainly on making it aware of all these tricky things on schemas that would make it crash or it would simply wasn't able to detect in the past. That's number one, and that would be on the parameters that you have available on the left-hand side. And also to help with the mapping and making unique field names on the right-hand side so that it wouldn't crash or make a weird definition on the field names. By the combination of all these parameters that you see on screen, uh, we are aiming to have XML Mapper be able, capable of processing any XML schema out there for no matter how complex it is. And I'll just show you some quick examples, as I said, for e-invoicing. So bear with me for one more second. Uh, the first one I'll quickly show is the Mexico invoicing. First, let me show you how the schema looks like. So the schema for, this is a real authentic professional. This is the official XML schema by Mexico provided by the government. Um, they call it CFDI, which stands for um, Compromete Fiscal for Internet Digital in, in Spanish, in English is the, the... Okay, so this is the schema. You see, it's pretty complex. It starts defining a lot of schemas inside of it, which is valid. It's okay. And then you have all the body. And this is a schema provided by the government to all those developers that want or need to use it be it third party or providers or software developers or anyone that needs to process the or work with the electronic invoicing, this scheme is provided for free by the government. You see it's pretty big, which is what you expect with a more professional uh, government level schema. So that's how it looks like. This is the transformation done with XML Mapper. So on XML Mapper, you have this uh, SQL-like uh, clauses, select each, which means uh, it goes pivoting on each one of the uh, repeating elements. 
And then on the second half, it defines the database structure. Now, for those that recognize this, this is the data structure of the good old T client data set, which has been in Delphi since Delphi 3. And the T client data set has two ways to load the data, can be binary, binary mode, or can be with this XML data packet. And this XML data packet uh, syntax or standard is the one used by XML mapper. So all this definition is the way that the T client data set expects. So this, you can feed it directly to an, a T client data set and we immediately recognize it. And you have a working database on the fly by feeding this one. So XML mapper is using this mapping, relying on a T client data set as the final um, client receiving the data. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot use other database engines, but the first one receiving the mapping must be the T client data set. That's, that's by design now. We are aiming to in the future add that it can directly post to FireDAC or any other data components, but not now. Right now, we're just making XML mapper work the way it should have done from the beginning. So this is the, the final definition rules. And here you have a sample XML file that complies with that Mexican uh, uh, schema. So this, this is an XML file, a, a, a real invoice, an electronic invoice. We're going to feed this electronic invoice and see how it's, it's been processed by XML Mapper. So we run the program, the demo program. What we do is load up, load up that invoice, invoice sample here. Okay, it's been loaded. So this program internally has those rules that I just showed to you. The rules that were created XML Mapper are now in the runtime component, the XML transformation file. And what you see, this is the, the T client data set that has been created. So based on those transformation rules or mapping rules, it loaded the, the, the invoice file. And here you have the database version of it. So actually, the only thing I had to do here is drop the components of the T client data set, drop the component of the XML transformation file. Then on the component of the XML transformation file, uh, let me just show you that to you. Uh, well, not now. Let me just finish the program. Then I'll show that to you. And you see all the data that was parsed and processed. Here we have the line items of the invoice. You click here. This is a built-in feature of T-Client datasets. If you have ever used them up, T-Client datasets have the internal feature of automatically recognizing nested datasets. What it means is I can click here and then I have the internal dataset that represents the line elements. That's one of the main reasons why XML Mapper relies on T-Client datasets because then XML Mapper knows that it can embed nested data sets in, in the data packet. And then you, you have this neat and nice feature. And I, I just clicked on the line items and then it popped up with this additional data grid showing me the line elements of that invoice. But it doesn't stop there. I can still go to this, which means the taxes, the, the attached taxes for this line item and I click and it opens yet a third level nested database that has the actual taxes. In this case, it's just one line, but, it, but in some cases, especially in the Mexican rules, you can have, well, actually many countries, not only Mexico, you have two, three or more different taxes that apply to that specific line item, then the capability is there. And this was defined on the schema, the schema provided by the government. Then XML, XML mapper is simply following that schema and creating this database structure following that schema. So every time you read, your actual invoice file, it will neatly fit and fill up this database because XML Mapper knew how to create the mapping based on the schema. So this is for the Mexican one. If I save the data set, then you get this version of the XML. This is the version data packet that you can separately feed directly to the T-Client data set. I'm just showing this for academic purpose. Most of you, whether you will want this maybe directly from the T client data set, feed then another file back or whatever that goes to your real final database. And we are, as I said, as a next step later, we want to see how to do that directly without you having to do that mapping yourself. The point is, this is how it looks like 
in the created um, data packet that the client data set can read directly in XML. And just quickly before I run out of time, which is I think an hour, I'll just show you just quickly how it also works with the Brazilian one, which is similar, but they have a completely different schema. The one by Brazil, somehow the, the Brazil government didn't want, didn't decided not to use nested databases, meaning on the schema used by Brazil, there's no nested elements. Everything is flat. So you can see the difference. So I'm feeding a, a sample invoice here. Sorry, not here. Data. Sample one. Okay, it's being processed. And you will not see nested data sets into the client data set because in the schema is flat. What you have is a very, very long flat database with a lot of fields. It's very extensive. So you can see that because of the flexibility of the XML schemas, each government can decide how to do the actual implementation. My point being is don't take any uh, e invoicing implementation from one country as the basis for another one. Each country is actually doing, following their own decisions. And I would say that the only exception to the rule is the European Union. Being the European Union, they are sticking to one standard. All the union members, European Union members are sticking to one single standard. And we are in the process of making that also work. So I'm just showing these quick samples. So I think that's about ready for the demonstration. Let me go back to here. And yeah, I just show you all this and thank you very much. I'm sorry about the problems that I had with the audio. And now I'm open for questions and answers. Thank you, Miguel. Thanks for all the hard work you've been putting in on this and for putting your presentation together. Sorry to everybody for the audio problems. Um, Technology is one of those things. It's like it works ninety nine percent of the time, but then one percent of the time it's like I have no idea what's going on. Paul says, "I tell you, Miguel is great. He always prepared for his presentations. Really knows topics he's discussing. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. It, it's unfortunate that yeah, where we had the issues because yeah, Miguel does a really good job on these sort of things. So there's a question here about how will uh, nested data sets be handled in XML Mapper? Nested data sets are detected automatically by XML Mapper." What it does is on those repeating, actually, let me show you that. If you bear with me for one second, I can show you that. So that Mexican invoice that does have the nested data set, I can just run it through XML Mapper and you will see what it does. So the key thing, oh, before I even do that, I'll just show you the original schema. The original schema, this is the original schema of the, no, no, not this one, sorry, is this one. Yeah, there, there is one thing here is, yeah, actually, it's not easy to see here. You, you, I'd rather write, rely on the, on the visual representation given by XML Mapper. It's much neater, neater to, to look at. So we just run it. You'll see it takes a bit more time. This is a more complex schema. So the more complex the schema, the longer it takes to parse it. But our goal is that it seems now is parsing all the schemas we have fed it with where in the past, any fairly complex schema would, would not work. Just wait for, wait for some seconds and they will be done. Uh, this specific one from Mexico, there is one element that adds up a validation of all the possible codes that it can have for zip codes. So believe it or not, the, the XML schema has embedded all the zip codes in Mexico, like uh, six, uh, more than 25,000 zip codes embedded in the schema. So right now, XML Mapper is reading that portion. Even though it's not used right now, it needs to parse it. But we found out that it's very strange thing. All the zip codes are embedded in the schema. So, and that, that makes this, that's the reason this one takes some time to load up. Others will be because there's a lot of um, sub-nested definitions of schemas, which is valid, meaning a schema defines another schema in another file, and then it, it makes it very, um, it needs to parse a lot of files to finally have the definition of the XML schema. All right. So while we're waiting for this to come up, actually, let's go and run the question here. If there's a, sure, sure. Ian, if you could pop up the next question. We're, we're running out of time. We need to start moving on to the next question here shortly. Yeah, I got it, got it, got it. Go ahead. 
Um, and we'll probably do another webinar with you later in the future. Um, can it handle child table for repeating nodes in XML? It seemed like that was something it couldn't handle before, but now it can. Is that right? Uh, repeat that. Child what? Um, can it child table for repeating nodes in an XML? Yes, repeating nodes is something it could not handle. Repeating nodes, uh, finite, finite repeat nodes, meaning that you could tell it this repeats five times, 10 times, whatever number. So the original XML mapper could handle one time only, which is the standard, which is you have only one time, or indefinite. Indefinite, and this is what I'm showing here. Yeah, I think this will answer the question. So look- so I can't the, do that now. Pardon me? It, so it's so that's something it, it can do now? It, it, it been updated yes, to do yes, that? it can. And, and this will answer the two questions. You see here on the screen, conceptos, which is line items. Underneath, there is an element with an asterisk. So this is when XML mapper detects something that can not repeat it endlessly, it will show these asterisks, and this will be mapped as a nested data set. That's the trick here. When you see this asterisk, it will be mapped to an nested data set, and also the icon provided by XML Mapper, the icon here is, is a small table. So this element maps to a nested data set. So anything here, all this, those will become the new field names of the nested data set. But that is, that is done automatically by XML Mapper when it detects an element that has uh, children elements like these ones that are defined to be repeated endlessly. So it's not just one time or two or three, it's simply endlessly, then that means it's a database. It maps it into a database, nested database. All right, fantastic. So uh, question, one last question is, is this available yet? So this this is an update, a preview of an update to XML Mapper that will be coming very soon. So um, yeah, I, there'll be an announcement on blogs.marketera.com when this update rolls out, but it should be available in the very near future. It's something that Miguel and some others have been working on for quite some time. So very excited to get this out and available to everybody, but should be available very, very soon. All right. Great. Well, thanks again, Miguel. And thank you, everybody else. And thanks for your patience. 